What's up everybody? It's Mover. Welcome back to the Mover Mailbag. I hope you're having a great, uh, what is it, Friday, I guess. Uh, all the days seem to be merging together with the uh, quarantine and corona. So speaking of that, uh, I always talk about if you're looking for a book to read, try to pick up the Spectre series. Well, uh, I've actually combined the Spectre series into a box set, so to speak. Uh, the first four books are available in ebook format, and I'll leave a link in the description, um, or you can go to my website, cwlemoyne.com. But from today, so today's uh, March 27th until the end of April, which I hope we are done with the quarantine stuff, um, just so you have something to do and just kind of as a gesture of goodwill, uh, I have reduced the price for the Spectre series box set down to 99 cents. So that's four books for a dollar. So I uh, hope that gives you something to do and maybe get you interested in the series. Uh, if you'll do one thing for me though, uh, if you do enjoy it, please leave a review wherever you bought it. It does help. Uh, it helps with the rankings and it helps other people uh, purchase it and uh, support the series, which supports the channel because this is a, an author vlog. So today on the Mover Mailbag, the very first question, it's not actually mailed to me. It's from the previous video from the Iron Eagle series. People seem to still have a problem with this, so I'm gonna explain it right now. Is it the Viper or the Fighting Falcon? The F-16, when it came out, was named the Fighting Falcon. I think there were some contests, some master sergeant was one, and you know, they go the birds of prey and all this stuff. But when it arrived to the squadrons, um, pilots thought the jet looked like a viper, the snake. And also Battlestar Galactica, as nerdy as that is, had vipers in it. So even though it was named the Fighting Falcon, it became known to pilots and maintainers and people in the community as the Viper. And that has stuck from the A model all the way to today. There's no difference between an F-16A being called a Viper and a C model being called a Viper. It's all, all F-16s are Vipers. And I think the F-16V, I think Lockheed actually started calling it the Viper kind of more officially, but it has always unofficially been the, the Viper. So people say, well, uh, it's the Fighting Falcon. Those are usually nerds that are like, actually, and wanna argue that just because it says it on Wikipedia, that's what it is. But the, really, it's the Viper. And usually the only other people that say it are the nerds and the Eagle drivers because they wanna get under the skin of F-16 pilots. But it's the Viper demo team. It's DCS F-16 Viper. Viper's just what it's called. So enough on that. Um, so when I refer to the Viper, I'm referring to the F-16. It doesn't mean different variations. I know some people are like, well, it's an MLU and not a, doesn't matter. They're all Vipers. Okay, next for the airline update, uh, a lot of stuff happening. Congress has, or at least the Senate has passed the $2 trillion stimulus. It's in the House today. It should be approved tonight. Uh, airline CEOs are actually talking they may not be able to accept the money and that's because it comes with uh, restrictions like having uh, government on the board of directors and some other stipulations with the loans and whether they can furlough uh, and what they can do with the money. So there is a chance that some airlines may not take it. Uh, and if that's the case, you can expect massive furloughs. And that might be the reason why they're not because they just can't make them make the numbers work. Uh, several airlines have furloughed since the last video like SkyWest. And I feel for you if you're a SkyWest pilot or just work in the company, uh, I think more furloughs are going out and have gone out. Uh, it's just a rough time for aviation and my thoughts are with you. And I forgot to mention, you know, gate agents, uh, the baggage handlers, the ground per personnel, they're all integral parts of this industry and we're all in this together. So I really uh, feel for you and, and know you're in my thoughts. As far as American goes, they just had the permanent leaves of absences bid for. Those results should be coming out today. I think over 600 pilots uh, volunteered for permanent leaves of absences where they get 55 or 50 hours from age 62 all the way to retirement uh, with full medical and stuff. It's a really good deal, I think, for them. Um, they will be bidding for the temporary leaves of absences right now, and they shouldn't. We should know the temporary stuff on Monday. Uh, from what I understand, Delta has withdrawn that option, so they were going to do uh, leaves of absence where it was paid, 
and they ended up withdrawing that because they said, well, it wasn't fair to the other employees. They had 10,000 that applied for unpaid leaves of absence. They said, well, this is not fair because the flight attendants uh, said, you know, why are pilots treated differently? And that kind of brings up another thing. If you want to be treated like a pilot, go be a pilot. Uh, there's a lot more training involved to being a pilot than a flight attendant. I'm not saying that flight attendants are not vital and they're not the front line and they're, they're not very good at what they do and they're not very important, but flight attendant school is nothing compared to 10 years to get to an airline job. The, the amount of hours and training and expense is, I mean, it's, it's a different universe. So there's a reason that pilots are, are treated differently because it is a skill position. You know, you can go from being a barista to a flight attendant in a, a month or two. You cannot go from being a barista to a major airline pilot in that time. It would take 10 years. So that, there's a reason that they're treated differently. Not everything has to be fair, but I hope they get that worked out. And then United, they offered 50 hours and I think they had something like two or 3,000 pilots take it. So hopefully that helps alleviate some of their manning problems. But I think we're in for a rocky ride and I think it's gonna get worse before it gets better. And that's just, it sucks. That's just the nature. And that's why I talk about always have a backup plan, always have something to fall back on so you're not just limited to this one industry because it is very cyclical. There's so many ups and downs. So enough said on that. Let's get to some of the questions from the mover mailbag. Obviously no actual mail because I've turned that off for now. But uh, let's take a look at some of the things you've sent me to uh, mover mailbag at cwlemoyne.com, which is the new way to do this. All right, this comes from uh, Nicholas. He says, how long did it take from the time you enlisted to the time you started flying jets? I'm 11 and very interested in flying jets and flying planes for military in the future, thanks. Um, so the way the process works, I've talked about this before in other videos, but uh, I started officer training school because you don't enlist. You go to officer, although technically you are an E5 while you're in OTS. But uh, from the day I started officer training school, so January of 2006, I'm dating myself here, um, to the time that I flew the F-16 for the first time, which was January of 2008, to the time I showed up at my squadron, which was January of, uh, or sorry, September of 2008. So about two years to fly actual combat aircraft and two and a half years to get your first get to your first operational squadron. So uh, you go to OTS, then you go to pilot training, and then you go phase one of pilot training, which is ground school and all the, the ground stuff. And then you go phase two, which is your T6. And then phase three, if you're gonna fly fighters, is T38s. Uh, so you graduate that. It's, by the time you, uh, it takes about a, a little over a year to go from officer training school to graduating that and then another year to get to your squadron. So two to two and a half years is about right. And then that depends. There could be delays in the pipeline because you've got all the training and schools you've got to do. So uh, it is a lengthy process. Next question. All right, this comes from Tim. It says, inspiration for being a fighter pilot. Mover, hope all is well amidst all of this hysteria right now. My name is Tim and I am 29 years old from Sterling, Virginia. I've been trying to become a fighter pilot since the summer of 2015. I really enjoy your show. Caught the episode about what drove you to chase the fighter pilot career. I was taken back by the episode. In July 2015, my mother succumbed to a brain aneurysm and was left in a nursing home for 15 months incapacitated before she passed. At the time, I had been trying to become a pro hockey player. We could see that it was the only matter of time before I need to find a different career. That event pushed me to become a fighter pilot like my mom's father who flew carrier fighters in the Marines. I got selected with a pilot slot in the USAF in March 2017, but DQ'd for vision during my flight physical. I tried for about a year to fight it with an ETP request. That's an exception to policy. About a year and a half later, got my class letter with everything suggesting that it got approved and I was heading to OTS. Two weeks before OTS, I got a call from my recruiter that they had made a mistake on my medical and have to select a non-rated position. At this point, I had already purchased my uniform, put in my two weeks notice of work and a 30 day notice on my lease. I had to fight to reverse those actions. Opted to decline the non-rated position, which they wouldn't reveal what it was, in favor of getting LASIK. Underwent surgery two weeks later, which was a success. Just under a year later, having taken the time, both my instrument commercial tickets, I'm applying, I'm about to apply for the U.S. Navy uh, Student Naval Aviator Board. COVID-19 looks to be threatening the upcoming board, but I'm doing all I can to get everything submitted and hope for the best. I have also been applying to various guard boards as well. I just wanted to connect and this, I think it's very cool that somebody else has gone through a similar path. I've gone through, accomplished what they set out for. Obviously, the circumstances of it are awful, but it's great that there are somebody else who's gone through it. Just wanted to connect when I hear about your mailbag. Stay safe, hoping for the best with the airline situation. Yeah, Tim, that's just, make them tell you no. 
you got to keep pushing. Don't accept, um, don't accept the wrong answer. So if somebody tells you you can't do it, well, make them prove it. Make the person that's actually in a position tell you no and just keep pushing. So I love what you're doing. I love your story. And I hope it works out for you with your uh, uh, student naval aviator board. I hope you get that because that would be an awesome story. And, you know, you're, you're very... You've got a persevering attitude, which is awesome. This is a mover mailbag question. Just wanted to comment on your recent Corona video as well as the other videos I've watched. I'm not a pilot in IT tech for an accounting firm. I came across your channel after curiously searching for documentary on the Concord supersonic jet. After watching that, YouTube started recommending aviation related video, which led me to yours back on point. I thought your perspective on the Novid situation was insightful. Aside from that, I have a non-pilot question. You've expressed interest in A-10 Warthog despite flying the F-16, F-18, T-38. As a military pilot, does one have the option of simulator training, flying an aircraft that is on base? As says, if you were an F-18 pilot on a military base, could you in the moment request to train and fly an A-10, pursue a possible evaluation transition of that aircraft, or would you be stuck with what you're qualified for? Uh, Follow-up question, have you ever flown or simulated with the A-10? So it's complicated. Um, on the reserve side, you have to get hired by a squadron that flies whatever you're looking for, so it's not that easy. On the active duty side, it is even more rare. Um, you know, it's sometimes common to go leave active duty and go to a reserve or a guard squadron that flies that, but to, to transition active duty from one airframe to another is just uncommon. Not impossible, just uncommon. So it's not that easy to just go, hey, I want to fly the A-10 now. Have I ever flown or simulated with the A-10? Yes, but not in relation to my job. Um, I or not in relation to being a fighter pilot. I was hired originally by an Air Force Reserve Command A-10 squadron, and I had access to the A-10 simulator, so I got to fly a whole bunch of hours in the A-10 uh, simulator prior to going to pilot training. But And I was also a field engineer for Lockheed Martin. But uh, I never got to fly it operationally, and um, it's very rare, even if it's on the base, you know, because you got security clearance stuff and all that stuff. It, it's possible, but... Usually you just don't have time to do it because you're worried about if you've got simulator time, you need to be doing stuff for what you're currently flying. But I uh, hope that answers it. It's just very rare to fly a whole bunch of different aircraft, unfortunately. This comes from Vernon. Hello, sir. I was wondering if you do a video on how to write a book and how to name it and sort of thing and keep up the good work with videos. I find them very informative, interesting to watch. How to write a book. Uh, I did write do a video on how I started writing. So I'll leave that link uh, in the description or a title card or something. Um, how to name it is probably the hardest thing uh, of any book that I ever write. I hate that. I hate writing the back cover stuff and I hate naming it. It was uh, just, I hate it. Those are the two things I hate the most. Um, it's tough, but um, I'll, I'll link the, the video I did about how I started writing. This one's called Side Hustle. Hi, Mover. First, I want to say thank you for what you do. I don't remember how I came across your vlog, but I really enjoy your content. Appreciate the inspiration and mentorship you've provided your viewers. In your recent episode about coronavirus and top five lessons you learned about the airlines, you suggest to find a side hustle. It may be even my paraphrase. To provide a backup income and downturn to the aviation industry. I enjoy sharing my heart of inspiration, encouragement, passion, the art of writing. What insight do you have towards producing income through writing? Here's a brief background, 38, ramp supervisor, large low-cost carrier. I've aspired a career destination as a pilot. Without unloading my life story, I've had struggles in my journey towards pilot career. Commercial pilot instrument rating, uh, 475 hours of flight time. Eager to pursue my employee pathway of my airline's pilot pi pipeline program. Thanks for your time. I really hope that that still continues for you. I'm not trying to be negative, but man, with the airlines kind of drawn down, I think it's going to be a long road for a lot of people. As far as side hustle and writing, um, there are paid writing gigs that you can find online through some of the online magazines. You just got to find one of those paying gigs uh, for blogging and kind of build your way up until you get some name recognition. Then you, you can start uh, maybe even write your own book, but you can always self-publish. You can self-publish your book and, you know, just write as much as you can. The, the best way to be a writer is to start writing. Just, just go after it and start doing it. And then eventually you'll hone your craft, uh, get in the writers groups and stuff like that. And then you'll build up to the point that you can use it as a legitimate side hustle, if you will. This question, uh, Mohammed, it says racism in the military. Thanks for all the great content you put out every week. Your story's given me a lot of much needed inspiration in my path to becoming a pilot. A little bit of background. I'm currently a sophomore in college degree in computer science. We'll be interning a large aerospace company. Also plan on finishing my pilot's license before my junior year starts, hopefully my 19th birthday, assuming the outbreak is contained. 
I understand this is a touchy subject. If you prefer to reply privately, I understand. Obviously, as a nation, we are currently fighting Islamic extremism, and as a result, it isn't uncommon for many people to take issue with my name, Muhammad. Personally, I don't associate with any religion, though I don't really think that that should matter at all in American, period. The vast majority of folks really don't care. However, I do have to deal with certain issues as friends, parents warning them about me, etc. Girlfriends, parents, bra forcing breakups, strangers talking trash. As cocky as it sounds, I feel it's a responsibility to educate people and do my part in eradicating ignorance. I understand that the vast majority of people could care less what my name is, but what religion my ancestors followed. I do not want to sound like I'm complaining. I'm a very proud person. Besides, I think that my name has great superpower of filtering out bigots from my life. However, given my experiences with this name, I can't help but wonder how it might affect my opportunity to serve my country. I was wondering from your experience in the military, what general attitude is towards Muslim people like me, a family that are uh, my mama in case, uh, how much do you think it'll factor for squadron hiring boards? Do you know anyone who's in my position? If so, did everything work out for them? Uh, if you have any overall advice, feel any attitude change, I'd love to hear it. Thanks for your, your inspiration and gift to the aviation community, Muhammad. The military is a melting pot. I mean, if any place, probably the most socially advanced part of our country is the military because race, gender, creed really doesn't matter. It's about ability, uh, whether you're um, a good person and can do your job. So in fighter squadrons especially, I don't think that that is there. I think you'll see that people, because nobody's real. We do first name Friday sometimes, and nobody ever really knows anybody's first name. It, we know last names and we know call signs, and that's it. And uh, as long as you adhere to rule number one, don't be a douche, uh, I think people will treat you fairly and people will treat you with respect. And if you're good at your job and you're a hard worker, I think the military is the place where it just doesn't matter. And now granted, there will be some douchebags and some people are just terrible people regardless of where they are. I think the military is very good when it comes to diversity and treating everyone equally and pushing past some of those stereotypes. So I think you won't, I don't think it's gonna affect you uh, becoming a, a, a pilot in a fighter squad or anything like that. I think you'll be fine. So uh, I wouldn't worry about it. Just do the best you can and be the best fighter pilot you can be. All right, one more question. This this comes from Alexander from Brazil. Hi, Mover. Your channel is both inspirational and entertaining. Watching your Mover Ruins movies got me thinking. One, can enemy fighter pilots really trash talk across the radio while in a dogfight? Is it easy for them to find your frequency? Uh, two, are small arms fire, AKs, and pistols really a threat against a strafing jet? I lived in Tucson for five years. I visited Davis Monthan, have a soft spot for A-10s, wants to get to see the Thunderbirds just killing it with their Vipers. Um, trash talk while in a dogfight. Well, the thing I think people need to understand is dogfights are exceedingly rare. I mean, they just, it really doesn't happen. Now, there is uh, what's called guard, 243.0 um, for UHF frequency that everyone can talk on so you can find and we monitor it so i guess theoretically you could trash talk on guard and talk to each other uh, especially if there's an intercept or something that might be where they try to raise you to intercept you and stuff like that but in general there's no trash talking i mean you're there's just no trash talking there wouldn't be any trash talking that's that's more of a movie thing just to make it interesting because otherwise with no dialogue it's just very little calm um, small arms fire if you get low enough, yeah, golden BB, man. Now, against an A-10, less so, but um, for you know other fighters, you get low enough, yeah, you know, a rifle round can do some damage. So um, it could be, but that's kind of why we mitigate it uh, by staying higher. You know, you want to stay above the small arms fire. So anyway, that'll do it for today's uh, mover mailbag. I hope that answers your questions. I know um, it is a trying time, but... This weekend, uh, stay tuned for the channel. I've actually, I think today, uh, I'm getting a surprise from uh, YouTube. So I will share that with you in a short video one day this weekend. So hope you are all doing well. Um, I mentioned iRacing in the last video. I'm still working on that. If you've got any experience with it or how to set up a league and what the best way to do it is, uh, shoot me an email, cwlemoyne, cwlemoyne.com. Uh, I'm still fairly interested, but it looks like it may be cost prohibitive to get people to join uh, just because how much it costs to, to buy the tracks and the cars and all that stuff for what I'm trying to do. So I don't know if we're going to do it, but um, we'll see. I am very open to the idea of having a uh, mover cup 
racing league where we just drive and have a good time and try to forget about the uh, woes of the world. Uh, but don't forget, Specter Series box set, which is books one through four, now available, uh, 99 cents. If it's not, because it takes a little time for it to circulate through the system, if, if it's not whatever uh, platform that you usually download it on, if it's not yet available, give it a couple days, it will be. I know Amazon right now is 99 cents, but maybe Barnes and Noble and Kobe Books and all that might take a little while. So just give it some time, but it, it will be for the entire month of April, 99 cents for the first four books. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Excuse me. Oh, no. Oh! About a lot of them. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, Don't be a douche. Rule number one. I can tell you now.